asking to give. The friend called at midnight. And now we're going to look at a few more different kinds of parables. This, these, these ones will be on prayer. I've discovered something in life. Maybe you've discovered it. It's difficult for me to ask somebody for a favor. But asking for a favor for somebody else is so easy because it's not about you. It's about somebody, somebody else. And this is what Jesus is going to tell us in this parable. Let's do a little revision. The first section of parables dealt with divine love. I cannot understand it, but he, he loves us in spite of who we are. And then mercy. He is such a merciful God if we slip up. And then justice. I need discipline. And then the second series of uh, parables, the plan of salvation, the way God saves us, not by our performance, but by his performance and allowing us to perform something in our lives. Section three, the reception of truth. What are we doing with the truth God gives us? And then indeed the transformation of character. He wants to transform us. I need transformation. And then the next one, the parable of prayer. May God bless us as we work through this one. This is a very important section, prayer, much prayer, much power. If you feel that God's standards are too high to reach, pray about the matter. Don't become discouraged. He, all his billings are enablings. Don't become discouraged. This is one of the prayers that he will answer if you ask him to help you. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, please man, lend me three loaves. And I'll tell you why. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey. He lost his way and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you. Of course, all the children slept with the father and the mother. And if I had six or eight children, he, he, he might step on some of them. I say to you, though he will not rise to give him because he is a friend, is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. What is Jesus trying to tell us here? I love these parables. It speaks to my heart. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. What an interesting message. And then Jesus says, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, and the fathers were listening, will he give him a stone? Uh, and they thought, Jesus, no, of course not. Or if he asks for a fish? And they ate fish at the Sea of Galilee. Will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Jesus, what are you talking about? And then, or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Wow. And they were listening to Jesus. He had something else in mind. Christ was continually receiving from the Father. Why? That he might communicate to us. The words which you hear, he said, is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. I just want to mention something. The greatest temptation 
Jesus had was to do something independent of his father. He agonized through nights, early mornings, to be dependent upon his father. And my friend, our greatest problem is to live independent from God. May God help us to overcome our independence. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. The word in Greek is doulos. He became a slave to serve us. What a, what a thought. If you then, now Jesus is going to tell them something and they're listening. But you then, now they are addressed. Being evil. Yes, 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 you are evil. Now we have to give good gifts, this is by contrast, to your children. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? My friend, this, this is a tremendous promise. Let's continue. Not for Himself, but for others. He lived and thought and prayed. Am I the center of all my prayers? Is there something I can learn here from Jesus? From hours spent with God, he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Daily, he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is our example. Do not enter a day without asking for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the early hours of the new day, the Lord awakened him from his slumbers, and his soul and his lips were anointed with grace that he might impart to others. Let's follow this example. Please, Lord, be with my lips today. May I speak words of comfort and encouragement. He received his words directly from the heavenly courts so that he may speak them to the tired and oppressed in due season. You know, when I first read this, I was amazed. So Jesus lived in absolute dependence upon his Father, praying almost moment by moment. How much more should we pray to be kind people? The Lord has given me, he said, the tongue of the learned, that I may know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. This is a messianic prophecy. Isaiah prophesied that this is how the Messiah will perform. Paternoster, this is on the, on the Mount of Olives. I usually slept in seven arches not far from here. But this is a, a very interesting place to visit. You know what Paternoster means? The Lord's Prayer. Traditional place where Jesus prayed, Our Father, you know it, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As, on, on, as in earth as it is in heaven. That's a beautiful prayer, it's a model. And I'm discussing this prayer in the series that I'm doing on the parables, uh, the, the uh, uh, Mount of Blessings, the Beatitudes. When you visit here, you have translations of the Lord's Prayer in many languages. I did not even take all of them, but I took a lot of them. So when people from different countries come here, they, they could read the Lord's Prayer for the first time in their own language. Christ's disciples were much impressed by his prayers and by his habit of communion with God. They listened to him. And they were amazed. One day after a short absence from their Lord, they found him 
absorbed in supplication, that's prayer. They came closer and they listened to his prayer. Seeming unconscious of their presence, he continued praying aloud. You know, sometimes we should pray aloud because the, the sound impacts on our emotions, on the frontal lobe. The more we speak things, the more we believe it. The hearts of the disciples were deeply moved. They've never heard prayers like this. As he ceased praying, they exclaimed, Lord, please teach us to pray. Please teach us to pray. We want to pray like you. In answer, Christ repeated the Lord's prayer as he had given it in the Sermon on the Mount. Then in a parable, he illustrated the lesson he desired to teach them. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, please, man, please, lend me three loaves. I'll bring it back tomorrow. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey. And I've got nothing to set before. Not a crumb in the house, man. Please, please, please help me. And he said to him, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey. And I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me, man. Hey, it's late at night. The, the door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you. Will he say it? No. I say to you, Though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, knocking and knocking, asking and asking, because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. What is Jesus trying to tell us here? Here Christ represents the petitioner as asking that he may give again. This is an unselfish act. He must obtain the bread, or else he cannot supply the necessities of a weary, delayed wayfarer, and there are so many of them. Though his neighbor is unwilling to be troubled, he will not ignore, stop, resist his pleading. Eventually, he will help him. His friend must be relieved. At last, his persistence is rewarded and his wants are supplied. In like manner, the disciples were to seek blessings from God in the feeding of the multitude and the Sermon on the, on the Mount, on the bread from heaven, Christ had opened to them their work as his representatives. They were to give the bread of life to the people. You know, they had a, a big commission. We've got the same. We've got the same. He who had appointed their work saw how often their faith would be tried. Often they would be thrown into unexpected positions and would realize their human insufficiency. My friend, this is our story as well. Realizing our human insufficiency. Souls that were hungering for the bread of life would come to them, that's the disciples, and to you and me. And they would feel themselves to be destitute and helpless. I've had so many cases where people came to me and I couldn't help them. They must receive spiritual food or they would have nothing to impart. But they were not to turn one soul away unfed. Christ directs them to the source of supply. If you cannot give what, they, what people are asking you, there is a source of supply, our Heavenly Father. The man whose friend came to him for entertainment, even at the unreasonable hour of midnight, did not turn him away. Knocking and knocking and knocking. Oh, let me get up. <laughs> he had nothing to say before him. He went to one who had food and pressed his request until the neighbor supplied his need. 
you know, my friend, this is a beautiful parable. Jesus wants to tell us something very important about the Holy Spirit in Christ us as far as this theme is concerned. But God delights to give. You don't have to beg him. He is full of compassion and longs to grant the requests of those who come to him in faith. He longs to help us. He gives to us that we may, what? Minister to others and thus become like himself. And God would, and would not God, would send his servants to feed the hungry, supply their need for his own work. If you want to work for Christ, you'll get into the situations, no bread, but he will supply everything you need to do his unselfish work. But the selfish neighbor in the parable does not represent the character of God. The lesson is drawn not by comparison, but by contrast. I like the way Jesus taught people. A selfish man will grant an urgent request to rid himself of one who disturbs his rest. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. I love this parable. The Savior continues. They were listening. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? And I can see the crowd, no, 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 Jesus, no, we'll never do it. If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? No, 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 Master. Jesus wanted to impress a beautiful truth. Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? No, no, Jesus, no, no, no. And then, and now they listen. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What a promise. Don't go through a day without asking for the gift of the Holy Spirit. To serve someone else. It's not about us. It's about someone else. It was not about Christ. It was the people he came to serve. To strengthen our confidence in God, Christ teaches us to address him by a new name. A name entwined with the dearest associations of the human heart. He gives us the privilege of calling the infinite God our Father. My friend, we are His children. He is not exclusive, He's inclusive. He wants you to ask Him, pray to Him with that name. You know, sometimes I, I cringe if I listen to the name of God that's used in vain. The model of prayer says just once, our Father, our Father, that's all. It's a sweet, precious name. This name spoken to him and of him is a sign of our love and trust toward him and a pledge of his regard and relationship to us. Spoken when asking his favor or blessing it is as music in his ears. You know, I've got a very independent child, one daughter. She never asks me. She asks me, she asks me once to uh, just lend me the money. She, she needs to produce a CD and it's a beautiful CD. But it's so nice when she asks me. She's very independent, just like a father. That we might not think it presumption to call him by this name. It's not presumption. He gives us the, the liberty to call him Father. He has repeated it again and again. So please, when you pray, speak to him as your Father. 
He desires us to become familiar with the name. He desires us to call him Father. God regards us as his children. Father, I'm your child. I'm in trouble. He desires us to become familiar with the name, our Father. God regards us as his children. He has redeemed us out of the careless world, the selfish world. He's our Father. Well, not all of us had good fathers, but here is the model Father. He chosen us to become members of the royal family, sons and daughters of the heavenly king. So if you call him father, you're part of the royal family. What a gift, what a considerate God, great thoughts to meditate upon. He invites us to trust in him with a trust deeper and stronger than that of a child in his earthly father. He invites us to trust Him. And He's the only trustworthy in the universe. Parents love their children, but the love of God is larger, broader, deeper than human love can possibly be. It is immeasurable. Man, I love my daughter. I'll die for her. And this is how you feel about it. But our Father cares more for us that we care for our children. Did you get the message, my friend? His love for us should be the motivation of living for him. Not everybody loves us, but the monarch, the creator of the universe says, I'm your father, you're my son. I love you. Then if earthly parents know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more Shall our Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit is a great gift. It's not a sudden flight of emotions. It's more than that. There's no time to do a lecture on the Holy Spirit, but he's a person. He points us to Jesus and Jesus points us to the Father. Christ's lessons regarding prayer should be carefully considered. There is a divine science in prayer, and his illustration brings to view principles that all need to understand. What Jesus taught in parables is so important. He shows what is the true spirit of prayer. He teaches the necessity of perseverance in presenting our requests to God and assures us of his willingness to hear and answer prayer. And by the way, the answer is not always what we want to hear, but the answer will be in love. Our Father loves us and he only gives us the best. Our prayers are not to be selfish asking. That's out. Selfish asking, merely for our own benefit. We are to ask that we may give. Uh, you know, I listen to people pray, just about, about myself, myself, myself. No, ask him in order to give. This is, this is mature spiritual life. We are to ask that we may give. Maybe you should review your prayer. The principle of Christ's life must be the principle of our lives. It's about others. The unhappiest people I've met in my lifetime are the selfish people. The most wonderful people I've met are the unselfish people. They just want to do everything they can for you. For their sakes, he said, speaking of his disciples, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified. John 17. The same devotion, 
self-sacrifice and subjection to the claims of the Word of God that were manifested in Christ must be seen in us. Did you get this? I want to repeat this. The same devotion, and that was a devotion, self-sacrifice, he died on a cross, and subjection to the claims of the Word of God, whatever the Word of God asked Jesus, he did, that were manifest in Christ, must be seen in us. My dear friend, may God help you and me to pray unselfishly. Our mission to the world is not to serve or please ourselves. If you want to please yourself, you'll be very unhappy because you will not get what you want people to give you. We are to glorify God by cooperating with Him to save sinners. This is our work. We're not all evangelists, but we can be kind to, to people. We can forgive them if they offend us. Give the flowers of kindness and forgiveness. Tomorrow morning when you get up, Lord, help me to give the flowers of kindness and love to someone. Oh, this is, this is, this is life. We have to ask blessings from God that we may communicate it to others. I think our prayers need to be revived. Pray to give to others. Only by imparting does the capability for receiving remain intact. Only by imparting giving does the capability of receiving remain intact. You cannot receive if you do not give. We cannot continue to receive heavenly treasures without communicating to those around us. Think of what you can give today and tomorrow. The capacity for receiving is preserved only by imparting. The capacity of receiving is preserved only by imparting. In the parable, the petitioner was again and again repulsed, but he did not relinquish his purpose. Perseverance is the master of defeat. So our prayers do not always seem to receive an immediate answer, but Christ teaches that we should not cease to pray. Live a life of prayer. Prayer is not to work any change in God. You cannot change his mind to tell him what to do. No. It is to bring us into harmony with him. We serve out of harmony. When we make requests to of him, he may, he, he may see that it is necessary for us to search our hearts and repent of sin. You know? You cannot come to him with a lot of grudges in your heart. Therefore, it takes us through test and trial, and we need it. He brings us through humiliation. You know, we don't want to be humiliated. We want to be uplifted and praised and complimented. That's not character building. It's character destroying at times. He brings us through humiliation that we may see what hinders the working of His Holy Spirit through us. If you pray for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin, of selfishness. There are conditions to the fulfillment of God's promises, and prayer can never take the place of duty. If you love me, Christ says, keep my commandments. My commandments of love, my commandments of unselfishness, caring for others. He who has my commandments and keeps them, says John, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Obedience is more important than we can ever realize. 
Those who bring their petitions to God, claiming His promise, while they do not comply with the conditions, insult Him and don't insult God. They bring the name of Christ as their authority for the fulfillment of the promise, but, do, but they do not those things that would show faith in Christ and love for Him. Don't command God to do what you want. Tread softly. You're working. You're walking on holy ground. Many are forfeiting the condition of acceptance with the Father. We need to examine closely the deed of trust wherewith we approach God. If we are disobedient, we bring to the Lord a note to be cashed when we have not fulfilled the conditions that would make it payable to us. Obedience. Are you disobedient, my friend? Then we have to agonize. We present to God these promises and ask Him to fulfill them, when by so doing He would dishonor His own name. He cannot answer every prayer you pray. The promise is. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. John 15. And then John declares, Hereby we do know that we know him. Yes, John, carry on. If we keep his commandments, he that says, I know him, and keep not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but who shall keepeth his word. In him verily is the love of God perfected. 1 John 2, 3-5 One of Christ's last commands to his disciples was, Love one another as I have loved you. Obedience and love cannot be separated. So the Holy Spirit will tell you there's something selfish in your heart. Fix it up, my child. I want to give you my love, my fellowship, and my presence in a marvelous way. But I want you to get rid of the ugliness of your heart. Do we, do we obey this command? Or are we indulging sharp and Christ-like traits of character? How do we speak to people? You know, I've got to be so careful. If I phone and it's the voice says, your patience it will be appreciated. Thank you for your patience. An hour later, your request will be answered. Be patient. And then somebody asks you, uh, what can I help you with? I need patience. I need to watch my lips. If we have any way we grieved or wounded others, and that's possible, it is our duty to confess our fault and seek reconciliation, that we may come before God in faith to ask His blessing. Have you wounded someone? Go to that person and say, I'm, I'm sorry. Next time, what could prevent a loving God to let our prayers go unanswered? Maybe you're praying about something and you do not get an answer. Next time, Jesus is going to tell us more about this wonderful love. May God bless you. Father in heaven, sorry for asking so much selfish things from you. Help us to revive our prayer life and ask to give. And there's so much we can give, not only money, but kindness. Help us to be givers and please help us to fulfill 
your word. In Jesus' name, amen.